In the summer of 1942, a squad of soldiers learned how to parachute jump the hard way. You know, in the 40s, uh, hardly anybody had flown the plane. And they said, well, get in the truck and we'll take you over to the airport and give you chutes and we'll give you a ride. So we got up in this damn C-47 and the guy said, stand up, hook up, stand in the door. And out we went. Nobody had ever been in an airplane before. But people did volunteer because they wanted to go for a ride, you see. And if you lived, you were qualified. This was how the men of the Devil's Brigade earned their jump wings. You'd done your first jump within a week. You didn't, you didn't have time to think about it. <laughs> 60 years later, another group of soldiers will do what those legendary fighters once did, put aside their fear and roll the dice. I'm starting to get the butterflies a little bit. You know, uh, it's the first time jumping, of course, like the rest of the guys, but I'm sure we're all gonna be scared. These men will do their very first parachute jump from 11,000 feet, not by static line, but free fall. Run, 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 run. Why? Because that's what it took to be part of the Devil's Brigade. January 22nd, 1944. The U.S. 5th Army invades the Italian coast south of Rome. If you're going to fight a war, let's fight it on somebody else's land, not on ours. We were going to take the war to the enemy. By the end of the first day, 36,000 men had come ashore at the cost of just 13 lives. As the soldiers took control of the port, they discovered, to their amazement, they had caught the Germans off guard. I thought it was great. I said, at last time, I'm really going to do something here, you know. The men believed they'd be in Rome within the week. They were wrong. Germans were the best soldiers in the world. They were best trained, they had a wonderful experience, and they had, uh, you know, that fanatical faith. What are all those things coming in? They said, those are shells from the Germans. Ooh, I volunteered for this. The Allies are stalled at Anzio, but patrol clashes are frequent. Here's a German outpost. By the time the first special service force came ashore on day 11, the invasion had ground to a halt. The German commander, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, brought the 70,000 veteran troops he had in reserve to the battle and surrounded the landing force. The battlefield was flat, as you know. There wasn't a hill over there to hide behind or anything else. You're sitting on a static line. Uh, the Germans evidently didn't want to wipe out the uh, beachhead not have, right after they uh, got in there. When the Devil's Brigade went into action, news of their arrival rippled across the front lines. Even the enemy heard the men had joined the battle. They say in Adabarfus, they snuck up on our advance posts, and the guards didn't even notice someone was approaching. They were quite agile. 
like leopards sneaking up. And before the guard even noticed, he'd had his throat cut. The first special service force was just a few hundred men in the midst of thousands. But they left an indelible mark. We own no man's land. That was ours. Uh, we, uh, the force was facing the Hermann Goring Division, which had 18,000 men approximately with the armor and everything else. And uh, by aggressively patrolling no man's land, capturing people, killing them, letting them know that we own no man's land, uh, they thought we were a much larger force. They thought we were a division in size. They had no idea that there were so few of us. This is where the first Special Service Force learned their killing right, skills. Helena, out. Montana. And these soldiers are fighting the Devil's Brigade way with no mercy. Grab like so. This is sissy. Grab like this. See the expression on the LT's face? Here's nothing. That's it. Either do it right or die. Got it? Many of these men are combat veterans. Some are Canadians who fought in Afghanistan. Others, Americans, who've recently returned from Iraq. They've come to the original Devil's Brigade training camp to spend a month in 1942, learning how those legendary soldiers trained. This hand here, you want to frame the weapon. Don't be up like this. Please, 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 get it down here. Turn your back at Sears, right? Start shaking. From movement, they can't detect movements. I'm right out of it. Ah! The finger. Boom. <laughs> The combative systems we've been learning are very violent, very aggressive. There are many things that are very applicable, especially in today's modern battlefield. You develop a sense of aggression, and you develop a confidence in your ability to close with and destroy the enemy. You know, it's, it's totally different when you've been trained with, a, with something like a bayonet, where you'd actually look at a person and insert the bayonet into the soft parts of the person's body and uh, kill the person that way. It's a totally different mindset, a totally different frame of view, and it's a frame of view that we need on the modern battlefield. When you're working your block, you need a wider angle, so you block wide, balls. Okay, there's the knife trapped. Okay, take it off him, all right? Because this is not gonna be a thing. Bill Wolf teaches hand-to-hand -hand combat to the Canadian Army. He's the type of instructor the brigade would have liked. Are you ready? <laughs> I love the balls. Wolf specializes in knife fighting. And even though many of these soldiers have seen combat, killing with knives, the trademark of the brigade, is not something they're used nope. to. When you're blocking, Mike, if he's coming at you from the side, try not to expose this because, okay, okay your armpit. So when you're coming in, do your block. Wedge it off to here. That traps out the arm here. Okay, I'm blocking. Try to keep your elbows inside your body, not out. I'll do that tight, yeah. He's taught that's better. Hand-to-hand -hand training with Sergeant Wolf is outstanding. It's intense, it's good, it teaches you some interesting skills. Some of the things that he does, we've never really addressed before in uh, training. It's almost like learning the, uh, kind of like the darker arts of, of learning how to, how to kill in combat with, with hands, knife, bayonet, whatever. The Devil's Brigade was led by an aggressive young American, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Frederick, who personally designed their killing knife, the V-42. I thought that was pretty neat. That was a dagger, it was really sharp, and uh, we used that for everything. And we was always taking the thing and we'd sharpen it on the side of our jump boot, on the leather boot, and we'd keep it nice and sharp. With a skull cracker on the end of the handle, the seven and a half inch blade was carefully shaped to allow easy insertion between the ribs. Frederick had created the devil's very own knife. Midnight. The soldiers are going on a mission to test their stalking skills. Their task? Infiltrate an enemy camp, dispose of the sentries, kidnap an officer. The Devil's Brigade called these Butcher and Bolt missions. 
Earlier I had a couple scouts go out to scout out the situation. They came up with a nice sketch here and we threw together a plan. Um, basically this is an area that we've worked in before so everybody's familiar with it and it's uh, it's the uh, machine gun range area, the uh, jungle lane. Uh, this is a trailer or sh a shed of some sort. Our intel tells us that there's two sentries posted outside there and our target is the general who is residing inside. At night, we get ourselves ready and we go out to patrol no man's land just to see what we could scare up. Paint our faces and uh, our hands with grease paint, uh, different colors, green, black. Uh, we just wore a wool cap, uh, our ammunition belts, and our weapons. That's all we had. Uh, dog tabs were taped together. It was quiet. You have nothing that makes noise. Nothing makes noise. As soon as ever your foot touches anything, you stop. Because that stick, if it cracks, could give away your position, but it could be a mine. You, you, as I say, you use all your senses, and so you're very mentally alert and ready every second. You're like the animal poised ready. To do these patrols constantly, constantly, they thought we were a big, full regiment, which we weren't. Such a small unit, small though it was, could tie up literally tens of thousands of German troops, getting in there and causing such a ruckus. Steal stuff from the Germans, their eggs, their chickens, their, anything that they could get their bloody hands on, especially their booze. This one German prisoner of war said, geez, we never hear them coming. We never hear them coming. All of a sudden, they're there. They called us the Black Devils because they said they never heard us coming. As Anzio became a stalemate and the regular units dug in, the first special service force stalked no man's land, clearing buildings, taking prisoners, ambushing patrols. One night, uh, six of us went out and we heard that there was a German patrol out there. And sure enough, after about three hours, I think it was, I know I was getting cold, we heard him coming down this one ditch. And the sergeant, he waited till that lead guy in that German patrol 
got within, I'd say, arm's length of him, and he hollered off tune to him to try to get him to give up. And the German made a mistake of turning around with his burp gun, and the sergeant opened up, and then we all opened up, and we got all six of them. On the bodies of their victims, the men left a chilling calling card. Stickers, which read in German, the worst is yet to come. Frederick's got the idea, as I understand it, and uh, not everybody got the opportunity to use them, but it was very effective. And there was the one situation where apparently this guy who was going out on patrol, and he said to the patrol, well, we won't kill him tonight. We'll just have fun and put a sticker on them, let them know we were there. They'd go out and stick the darn things any place, even if they didn't find any Germans. They'd just stick the sticker out. And I think that put the fear into the enemy quite a bit. The fact that we were calling around them, calling around their area, they didn't know or didn't see, and yet in the morning these stickers were there. And the enemy was terrified. Legend has it a dying German officer scrawled in his diary, they are everywhere around us, these black devils. That was strange, that was in that, that German officer's diary. We can't cope with these uh, these uh, devils with their painted faces and their baggy pants. And then the media picked it up and nicknamed us the Devil's Brigade. Finally, after more than three months, the Allies broke out of the Anzio beachhead. The first special service force led the way. Our battalion was one of the lead battalions breaking out of Anzio. That yeah, was quite an experience. That was a tough fight. First day we were thrown back, uh, we didn't get out at all. And the second day we finally made it. The only time I was ever close to being bloodthirsty was when we broke out of Anzio and they killed my colonel right beside me. Uh, I, it was all I could do to keep from shooting these guys coming out with their hands up after, after killing my colonel. We had a couple of rough battles on the way to Rome. One place there, but I thought, my God, we'd be lucky if we get through here. Because we were going through a, I think it was a wheat field. There was nothing to protect us. And the Germans were set up with machine guns and everything. And But we made it. We took the machine guns out and then we moved on into Rome. And going into Rome was a real charge. Uh, we had driven the Germans out of the city. The people were wild. Uh, they had all sorts of fruit and wine and stuff to give us, and they tried to give it to us, but as soon as a shot fired, they, were <laughs> they disappeared. And uh, I can remember going up the streets in Rome that morning, and the darn machine gun bullets coming from the Germans were hitting the walls all around, you know, ricocheting around, and scaring the pants right off of me. But we got up there, and uh, it was my company had the job of securing six or seven of the bridges across the Tiber. They didn't want the uh, Germans to blow the bridges up, otherwise we couldn't get across. Some of them were charged, ready to blow, but we got them before they blew them. And uh, the next day we had Rome. Being one of the first units into Rome had its benefits. The Devil's Brigade enjoyed a party more than most. When we would go to any town, Italy or France, you know, the dog faces, as they call us, they got their hanging out of their rifle. The goddamn thing, I had enough of this war, you know. And then the Germans had left. Then these girls would come out, whew, the girls would come out with wine and some stuff. You know, they, they had nothing to eat, but they gave us this wine and stuff. By the time this regiment or whatever company got to the other side and everybody was drunk. I mean, they were drunk and they were kissing the girls and everything. The women was, that was it. That's what we were in the war for, for women. But you never got, you never got involved other than just getting, getting some. As the veil of fascism lifted, the citizens of Rome celebrated. But for the Devil's Brigade, the war was far from over. 
Hitler ordered Kesselring to fight a war of attrition, to delay the Allied advance for as long as possible. The Devil's Brigade and all the other men they fought beside paid a terrible price for every inch of Italy. One of our things that we were taught is when you're moving ahead and taking ground and you got them on the move, try to keep them on the move. Because if you give them time to set up, they got time to do a lot of damage, like setting booby traps or setting up good defenses. The German army had an extensive catalog of mines, which they used to slow the Allied advance. The Teller Mine. The Shrapnel Mine. The Wooden Holtz Mine. A lot of times, a booby trap, if something don't look natural, don't touch it. I mean, it, if you'd see a deserted house there with something real nice sitting up on top of a dresser or something, something's wrong. What's that doing sitting there, you know? The townspeople were warned against enemy mines and booby traps which were in the process of being cleared. Tens of thousands of booby traps were also left behind. And as they do today, they killed at random. They don't call them booby traps anymore, but rather IEDs, improvised explosive devices. So once the square pin's pulled, all you gotta do is pull your main safety. And In Afghanistan tight. and Iraq, they're taking a terrible toll on men like these. So here's our tripwire. And I, got, I made it incredibly loose. But just go ahead and pull on that, and I'll try to hold this. See if we get a little bigger. It sounded a little better, didn't it? <laughs> Okay, then the same chain of ignition. Angelo Godola is a sergeant in the National Guard who recently lost a family member to an IED in Iraq. My brother in law Paul was killed uh, back in December, December 21st, 2004, and it has a profound effect on everyone. A loss is expected, you know, soldiers are there to fight for freedom and uh, to fight for their family's welfare and for their country. You know, uh, whether it's insurgents or Nazis or uh, terrorists of any kind, you know, any kind of uh, terroristic regime or whatever you want to call it. But uh, soldiers are there to protect their people, and uh, that's what I do. Like, let's say, uh, which, yeah, exactly. The instructors have given the squad a simple task. Cross this field. But hidden in the grass, are tripwires and booby traps, the sort of IEDs the Devil's Brigade faced. We was going out on patrol one night, and the first guy in the line stepped on a foot mine and blew his foot off. Now, sometime, they snuck in there and put that mine there on a path that we knew we, that they was pretty sure that we used, you know. Let's face it, they wasn't dumb either, you know, and almost anything they'd booby trap if they had time to do it. And they, they'd done a lot of it, especially when they'd retreat. Albert Boucher is a master warrant officer in the Canadian forces who served in Afghanistan.
Despite the technology today's special forces use to find IEDs, the modern battlefield is as deadly as ever. And the rules of survival are the same as they were in the Second World War. Trust your training. Hope you're lucky. Pressure release. Go around it. Albert Boucher, a 40-year-old father of seven, put his life on the line to go to Afghanistan. People often question me about, you know, what were my thoughts on deploying overseas and, and should we be there? And, well, it's not my decision to be there, but what I will tell you is that as a soldier, as a person, I can see the changes that have occurred. There's hope, there's a sense of development, and uh, as a person, as a soldier, as a citizen of the free world, I think that's a good thing, and I think we should be there. As early as the 16th century in Italy, Leonardo da Vinci was sketching and designing parachutes. But it's only about 10 years since the Russians began to take the parachute seriously as a weapon of attack. Vigorous training, hazardous duty, for those who want to get into the war quickly. This was how the Devil's Brigade sold itself when it went looking for recruits. And there's no faster way to get into a war than jumping in. Feet first. 28 men can get out of an aircraft as fast as 18 seconds. There's waves and waves coming over. In other words, there's people jumping right over top of you, and you can steal each other's uh, air, and you can plummet right in like a tent peg. So everything is mental alertness, and uh, you don't have time to daydream, period. The parachute training the brigade received was rudimentary at best, non-existent at worst. OK, there's a few things we want to cover this afternoon. We'll do some flight trainer. We'll talk about the equipment. Then we'll talk about how to collapse a chute because it didn't have canopy release on the equipment itself. And then we'll move all the way down there where the mock-up is and do some aircraft drill. In 1942, the US Army jump school lasted about a month. In the Devil's Brigade, it lasted a few days. You jumped twice. And if you could walk away, you were qualified. The parachutist came up to approximately here with the static line. We'll let it go. The static line would go there. He would kept on going. Jump master would take control of it. He would square himself up, feet apart, nice and relaxed. And when you jump, be careful there. Jump straight out, and where you go. Go! Basically, you didn't have time. They just had little mock-up towers, and they told you how to put a chute on, how to collapse a chute, uh, about what height should be. You'd jump out of these mock-up towers to uh, get on the ground. Then they put you on the back of a truck and put the gate down, and you jump off the back of the truck doing about 18 mile an hour. And that's about how you'll get it when you get down. And you, you didn't have time. Within a week, you'd done your jump. You done your first jump within a week. You didn't. You didn't have time to think about it. <laughs> I don't think I was scared. I think maybe I was more curious. But uh, standing in the line, I think I was more concerned with the fact that I was checking the guy ahead to see his equipment was okay. The guy behind was checking my equipment, and I checked my hook on the cable. And when the time came time to go, it was bang, bang, bang. We're gone. I had no idea what was going on, frankly. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen next. You know, kind of got your fingers crossed, but all of a sudden, poof, your parachute opens, and you say to yourself, geez, this is pretty nice, and float down. All these soldiers have their parachute wings. Some have jumped into combat. But there are other men in the squad who've never jumped before. Today, they'll get their chance. I'm starting to get the butterflies a little bit. You know, uh, it's the first time jumping, of course, like the rest of the guys, but I'm sure we're all going to be scared. But um, when I get, go to jump out of the plane, that's going to, you know, really, it's going to hit me in the stomach. I get the, I get the major butterflies before any big event. 
The key is with any of these canopy issues is number one, altitude awareness. Okay, so as soon as you get open, check your altitude. Jay Budd, the Green Beret, has done almost 100 jumps, many of them what special forces call halo jumps. High altitude, low opening. Distorting the nose a little bit, okay? The key is with this is to do... Jay has brought the men to a parachute school to do their first jump. If things go wrong in free fall, you, you just have to remember to arch. Sometimes on, on their first jump, some, when people jump, um, they try to de-arch a little bit. And when, when you happen to de-arch, then your problems become worse. And that's when you could possibly tumble and tumble and all that. So basically, if things go wrong up there, um, just, you just have to arch it out. And that should stabilize you. A little bit of leg, a little bit more legs here. A little bit more legs. There you go, perfect. OK, exit. When the brigade jumped, they didn't have time to arch it out. The men left the aircraft at 1,000 feet without a reserve. If the main chute failed, they were dead. The danger to these men is less, but the challenge the same. Do they have the guts to jump? Albert Boucher is certain that he does. 9,000 feet, check left, check right. Wait, whoa, 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 did you see anything for me? Nope. OK, thanks. Check right. There we go. Thumbs up. Heading 7,000 feet. I've bungee Heading. jumped before and, and uh, scuba dive, so I just uh, and lead climb there a couple days ago, so I, I just want to do it. I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah, I'd like to just jump. <laughs> I don't want to yeah, I don't want to wait around too long. I just want to try it. Old soldiers have a saying, courage is a mystery which comes and goes in moments of action, accidents of choice. On this day, these young soldiers have all chosen to be courageous. They volunteered to do their very first jump, not on a static line, but free fall from 11,000 feet. Chris Bird, the sniper, is first to go. He barely pauses. Andrew Rowe, the 19-year-old from Nova Scotia, shows why the squad calls him the fighting fetus. Angelo Godola says a quick prayer and trusts that somebody is actually listening. And finally, it's Albert Boucher's turn. Albert has traveled a long way in his military career, from his regiment in Saskatoon, to the mountains of Afghanistan, to the skies over Montana. Life, he says, is one big adventure. Freefall is, is awesome, and I, I wish it would last longer because you know you, you're concentrating on your drills, and it just seems to go go quick. You can feel like all of a sudden the air got warm, you know. And you say, okay, that's I must be getting close now. And it is about 7,000, and then and then six lock on, and, and then pull. Cool. I had a good time. And then when uh, I wanted to mess around with the shoot there, because uh, it was a pretty good feeling when you're under, under the canopy spinning around there. That was awesome. <laughs> with his first jump behind him, Albert is ready for more. He's the type of soldier who'd have been at home in the brigade, smart and brave, with just a touch of crazy. For almost a month, these men have trained as hard as they ever have before. They've run and climbed, fought and bled. All of it to prepare for the mission which made the Devil's Brigade a legend. 
Okay guys, 21 days of training has finally come to an end. You've been going through all kinds of training day and night. We obviously lost a couple people. That's part of the training. Now it's time to move on to the next phase. You all know that there was something that you were not told, and this is what we're about to reveal. Just grab the corner. This was the area where the Devil's Brigade became so famous. And this is what you've been training for. Your mission will obviously be to do exactly what they did way back then in 43. The Devil's Brigade assault on Mount Defensa was one of the most daring strategic victories of the Second World War. The Germans held the peaks, the Allies wanted them, and wave after wave of infantry died trying to take the mountain. The first special service force took Defensa in just a few hours. Joe Glass, from Sarnia, was one of the first men to reach the top. Lauren Whaling, Joe's best friend, was close behind. And Mark Radcliffe, a young lieutenant from Texas, helped plan the assault. These three men survived what was thought to be a suicide mission. They are the human face of courage. I was with 3rd Regiment, and we were in a gully down below here. We, we were sitting in there, waiting till we might be needed, and all of a sudden, right up above me, a mortar round goes off. I yelled the command to get down and hit the dirt. Well, just as I'm doing that, the, a round hit right almost in front, not too far away and I got a piece of shrapnel right between the eyes sticking out, about that big. And I didn't know I had it, it was numb. And they took me down to the aid station down below. And the doctor walked up and he feels around on it and his hands are going like this. And I says, what are you shaking for? I says, I'm the patient. He says, but you're my first. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I started the war. <laughs> that's the first time I, I hadn't fired a shot. <laughs> the next day, we had to go all the way up here, right up in here, where they put the ropes up in the cliffs. And we went up. The bowl seems to be small there. But we come up right here, and we attacked, and uh, it took us two hours to take that out. We took all these guys out. We lost a few men, quite a few men, in fact. We done a good job, real good job up here. How can you explain combat? If you've never been in combat, you know you can't explain it. So we had a, just had a good fight. Got it over in two hours. I lost my company commander and a few good friends. And a guy hit me in the face and uh, the hand. It hit my little finger right there with a bullet. And then it hit the rock and it splattered rock on my face and I couldn't see out of my right eye. So I moved over, got behind this rock about this high. And this one guy, the last guy, he never give up. And my company commander come up one side of me and Sid Gath on the other. And he said, how's things going, Joe? And I said, OK. I said, but whatever you do, don't stick your head above this rock till we get that guy. And I was planning on getting some grenades and getting them out the easy way. Because you couldn't, he was real good marksman. He hit several guys. But they both raised their head at the same time, and he got both of them through the brains. The brains splattered out in the ground. And so I moved over and talked to Don McKinnon. 
and he was there, and he said, Jesus, Joe, I'm scared. I said, hell, we're all scared. Have a cigarette. I wanted a cigarette bad. <laughs> so I lit up two cigarettes, and I borrowed two grenades, and there was only 25 feet away from us. So you know how close we were. It was easy to get a grenade in there, but I didn't have any. But I got two of them, I think, from, I think, Sid Gath or Rotham, who were both dead. And then we tried to get him out, and I don't know who got him. But it didn't matter, he was the last guy. But he'd already killed my commanding officer and one of my best friends. In Defensa's shadow lie the men who died on that brave but terrible morning. Americans and Canadians. Men like Joe's friend, Sid Gath, a farm boy from Manitoba. After the war, Joe, Lauren, and Mark came back to Montana, where they each settled down and lived in peace. Being a soldier, you're willing to lay your life down for what you believe in, especially if defending your country or freedom. And uh, the soldiers are always in a brotherhood. So with that in mind, I mean, we each have those common qualities or uh, common interests just to be here to you know, represent them and honor them. So I think that's a pretty damn uh, strong bond between us. And it's incredible to see, uh, you know, we met three of them were members of uh, the Devil's Brigade, and that was kind of amazing. You know, you're meeting these old men, you know, and they've lived their lives out, and they're having trouble walking, and, but then you see it in their eyes, you know, and I, I told some of the guys, like, you, you walk up to them and you shake their hand, and they still have that firm grip. And I mean, the one gentleman, I can't remember his name offhand, but his hand was huge, and his fingers extended up my wrist, and I was like, wow. You know, I'm, I'm glad I wasn't on the receiving end of this guy when, when uh, you know, World War II was going on. But you see it in their eyes that they're, uh, they're proud that they were part of it, and they're even more proud that somebody's willing to represent them here. Where's his box, eh? As any soldier will tell you, the real work of army life begins when the training ends. I can't put it down. Anybody? Did you get my frags? No, not yet. And for this squad, there's plenty of work to do before they leave for Italy. As far as uh, getting ready for our mission in Italy on Defensa, um, I think we've come a long way, and I think that uh, the training we did here in the mountains is really going to help us to. Uh, accomplish our mission overseas. We're really uh, starting to mesh, I think, and all these guys have what it takes to do real missions. I mean, I wouldn't hesitate going on a real mission with any of these guys. And Defensa will be a mission to test them because the men will face an actual opponent. Good, uh, grundsätzlich uh, zur Orientierung, diese Richtung uh, Norden, diese Richtung ist Rom. A unit of veteran German soldiers has made camp on the summit. And if the men are to do what the Devil's Brigade did to defeat the Germans, they'll have to climb Defensa's cliffs, something which has Brian Haynes worried. The climbing that we've been training on is really making it hit home about the uh, climb that we have ahead of us at Defensa. We've done all of four days of training and climbing. And we're all, including myself with my fear of heights, we're all doing pretty good as far as getting up the rock face. But we still have, uh, we don't have the kind of experience that I think is probably necessary for a climb as big as I'm hearing Mount Defense is. Brian's instincts may be right. The assault on Defensa will be like nothing the men have ever done. To reach the Germans, the squad must climb to the top of this 3,000-foot-high mountain, crossing bridges and boulder fields as they do. But the real test will come on Defensa's cliffs. If they're to live up to the legend of the Devil's Brigade, Brian and the rest of the men must climb these cliffs at night.
Next, on Devil's Brigade, contact. I was scared. And I think the only way I got over it was action. I did something. Different men have different reactions. Uh, I, my reaction was I had a, got a coppery taste in my mouth. The first special service force takes the mountain, but at a terrible cost. I saw Captain Rothland go down to accept the surrender, and the Germans shot him. Instantly, the word went out, we don't need any prisoners. And the squad finds climbing the cliffs harder than they ever could have imagined. This is, this is not safe. That's next on Devil's Brigade.